their highway infrastructure, issues subject to the development of land. Um, coordinating these is, is not a trivial matter. And uh, the municipal planning area has lots of really challenging, uh, difficult uh, issues associated with that. Uh, road network planning. Um, adding a road can sometimes make things slower. Adding a new road, you might think it's adding capacity. It's only adding the number of lanes available and so on. Sometimes it can gum up the works. If the road comes in at a place that leads to traffic congestion, it actually can worsen things. Project management. Um, no one here, I think, is uh, at the moment is in my 371 class. There's two people who will be coming in. But I teach a course in software, software project management, software development. And this is an area just rife with issues having to do with nonlinear effects. It's one of the reasons software projects can go bad in a hurry. Within a matter of a few months' time, a project that was looking really, really good can get stuck in a sort of rut, which is very difficult to get out of. It can get locked into a bad situation with low morale, fatigue and overwork, high turnover, inability to keep institutional knowledge, need for documentation, which feeds back on poor quality, feeds back on low morale, etc. So you can get in a sort of vicious cycle where the project goes south in a hurry. Human, human relationships can get in that same sort of issue, where a relationship that's been stable for a long time suddenly becomes unstable and uh, starts, to, starts to go in a direction where the two people feel further and further apart. Healthcare policy, uh, another one I do a lot of work in in healthcare operations. Um, these are just a few. One of the commonalities to all of these is that um, behavior of a whole is greater than the sum of its parts. It's, it's very hard to, to sort of take a look at a decision making challenge in these areas, to simply decompose it into a few simple principles, solve those and combine them together and get a solution for say the whole company or the whole um, municipality. And secondly, it's all too common to see decisions that are based on really narrow understanding of the situation leading to blowback. And there's some classic cases I'll be talking about where decisions that are based on too narrow an understanding of the situation, situa uh, uh, decisions that are not systemic in their view, lead to really nasty consequences. So we talked about emergence. Uh, interaction of very, very simple components can lead to surprising behavior. Behavior over time, behavior over space, over a network, which are just very, very different than what you see in any component of the system or the sum of what you see in different components of the average. Um, and typically, this is associated with, with systems where change in one area of the system can ripple through in unexpected ways to to other areas. And we'll, we'll see plenty of examples of this um, in the course of the semester. We saw some of them last time, where you know a change that one introduction of an infective at one place in that diagram led to a whole cascading series of, of infections which eventually swept away space. Now traditionally, if you look at the history of sort of scientific investigation, for the past uh, four or five hundred years, it's been dominated uh, predominantly through a fairly um, what might be called a, a reductionist uh, approach. And that, that seeks an understanding of how a system works, understanding of um, how disease is caused, understanding of uh, how supply chains work, or understanding of how best to engineer a road system um, in a way that takes apart pieces of the system, understands each piece, and and then um, seeks to gain insight from that deep understanding. And this, this strategy has really offered profound insights. So we understand, for example, that there are very specific pathogen, what might, we might call informally a germ, which causes disease and so on. And we understand how cancer understand, you know, emerges at the molecular level. The problem is that all too often, when we take a system apart like this, it's kind of like taking a transistor radio apart or taking a computer apart for a kit. You take it apart and then you don't know how to put it back together again. You don't know why the behavior of the system as a whole emerges from all these parts. So you have an understanding of each part. 
just like you have an understanding of that model we ran last time. The understanding of the parts is important, to be sure. Changing those parts has, has an effect. But there's a science, ladies and gentlemen, that transcends that. There's a science of the whole, the science of, of uh, the behavior of an interaction which transcends, which goes beyond that understanding of the individual pieces. And system science seeks to establish that, that sort of understanding of the whole, that understanding of, of how uh, the, the behavior of the whole is more than the sum of the pieces. So much observed behavior we see in the world is in fact emergent. It results from the collective interaction of a set of components rather than any one component of isolation. And so while we have a, a quite reductionist sort of approach to science traditionally, whether it's sequencing genes or understanding um, the matter down to the level of quarks or other elementary particles, whether it's uh, seeking to understand, you know, decompose a building into its pieces, we have to, at some point we need to build it up. We need to make decisions, for example, that involve many components of it. We need to understand how that behavior of the whole emerges. And the, the, the understanding of those pieces in isolation is not going to give, give that to us. It's, we have to understand the interactions. And system science seeks us seeks a way of understanding the implications of those interactions. So, you know, in computer systems, we may understand a detail how a server, a router, a network connection works, but adding just one may drastically alter the performance of the system, or deleting one. Having one go down may lead to the system to undergo a, um, a sort of a, a degradation to a level of performance that's wholly different, that's qualitatively different than what we would have seen previously. We may have a profound understanding of physiology and immune function, but it confers really little understanding of how disease spreads in a population. We understand well the travel of cars on a single road, but we don't understand how it change, how how changes to a road network will affect that flow. We understand how placing an order works, unclear how it will affect the inventories and in reordering elsewhere. Um, and people have found that with the Human Genome Project, there was a kind of millennial sense that will finally understand how things work. And now, long after the sequencing of the first full human gene, we realize the key thing is increasingly figuring out how all these things work together. Just understanding those genes in isolation is just not going to give us the understanding we need. We need functional genomics. We need metabolomics. We need, to, we need the science of the whole to be added to those components. And one of the real challenges with these behaviors is something we saw a little bit in that example last time. Um, we can get behavior that's, that's not immediately anticipated. So when we added in some components to that system, we may have expected um, some behaviors. For example, when we changed how long it took someone to recover, or the likelihood of infecting someone. Sometimes we expected one behavior and we got something different. We got an infection that never appeared in the first place, that never spread, instead of something that just spread slower. Or a situation where we started seeing waves of infection instead of simply a, uh, a recovery of the entire surface. It can lead to misperceptions. Um, if we don't understand how it works, we may overinterpret a trend. Policy resistance, case of where we make a decision, we want to achieve X, and we get back something very different than X. We may get only a very, very small amount of X, or we may get negative of what we saw. It. We, we get kicked back, as it were. We may get disproportionate impact, you know, just speeding up um, the, the, the speed of treatment, for example, may lead an infection to die out altogether from the population. Vaccinating one more person may mean that the disease can no longer establish itself. The illness can't spread in our population. And these phenomena, they pose problems. They pose problems not only for deciding among different choices. How do you effect, uh, effectively run a, a project, a software project that's running late? What do you do? Do you, do you try to cut back on the testing? That has a way of popping up somewhere else popping out in terms of late discovered bugs or in terms of customer complaints? Do you try to hire more people? That 
has a way of popping up. Look at Brooks Law. Adding, adding people to a late project makes it. Did anyone complete that? Has anyone heard of Brooks Law? Frederick Brooks, author of Mythical Man Month. Adding people to a late project makes it later. Yes. Could because you got to train them. You got to bring them up to speed. There are quality issues up front. Those quality issues lead to ripple through the bugs. And, um, takes time to hire them. Then the interview process takes your time away from other things. And often the real problem is coordination. It's, it's an issue of the whole. It's not an issue of any one person, just the number of people. It's an issue of how do you coordinate most effectively. And adding people in makes the coordination problem more difficult. To it's more difficult to divide up the work. So coordinating is another uh, big, bigger challenge uh, within these systems and designing systems. So suppose we can go design our own firm or design our own computer system or design our own road network or design our own public health system. How do we structure that so it works effectively? How do we structure it so it's not unstable? That it, that it exhibits stability, that it, that it uh, doesn't get knocked off by simple incidents. In, in a way that leads it to, um, to lead to more and more dysfunction. So, you know, sometimes you have a system which by itself is not a problem, you know. Some, some people are very, very strong and some people are not so strong. But you hitch it up in the wrong way. You have the, the relationships between these components being wrong and you get that dysfunctional behavior. In this case, the boat's going around in circles. Because you have two elements arranged in a way that's completely unhelpful. This is, this is an example of a systems problem taken, taken um, as a joking matter. But it's, it's actually no joking matter. People have given names to these phenomena. Brooks Law is what I mentioned. Adding people to a late software project makes it later. Uh, coined, gosh, 20, probably 30 years ago now. Um, some of these laws are not necessarily adverse. Uh, Metcalfe's Law. Does anyone know Metcalfe's Law? People have heard that before, taking uh, computer networking. It's named after Bob Metcalf. Anyone know who Bob Metcalf is? He's the inventor of the Ethernet. Um, he uh, created sort of networks we rely on uh, routinely for high-speed data communication. And he argued that the value conferred by a network goes up with the square of the number of nodes. Not linearly, not just proportional to the number of nodes, but with the square of it. Why the square? Can anyone give me an argument? For each new node you add in, that node can communicate with all the nodes that are already there. So you get this sort of accumulation of value, you know, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, you get n times n minus 1 divided by 2, if you remember that, um, if you sum up those numbers. So the value conferred by a network, you know, each new node gets more and more value as you add each successive one in. Building up, a, you know, building a new road can work some congestion, vaccinating just one more person, can draw the infection out. A vicious cycle and trust can result. Suspicion, hiding things, etc. Happens in projects. I've been part of projects where this is kicked in. It happens in families. It happens in, in companies. Arms races, another systems phenomenon. Each side has more than enough nuclear weapons to destroy the entire world, but they compete uh, in a way, uh, each, each driven by the, uh, the gains of the other, and commercial competition. Um, so uh, you folks probably don't remember it well, but uh, back in the dot-com era in the late uh, 1990s, beginning of 2000, there was uh, a competition to lay fiber, to lay fiber optic fiber, which went unused for better part of a decade, I believe. Um, this competition among, among corporations, each seeking to sort of benefit from the dot-com explosion, which turned into the dot-com implosion. And there's a bunch of issues. So I work a lot in, in the health area. Um, there's a lot of issues where narrow decision-making bites us back. So we build better antibiotics, build more antibiotics, treat bugs with them, and then develop drug resistance. People sought to lower the health burden of cigarettes, lower the number of people dying from lung cancer or heart disease by lowering 
the, the levels of carcinogens, so-called tar informally, and the cigarettes. And that sounds great. You've got, think about a smoker, they're smoking away. Each cigarette they smoke, they get less exposure to nasty stuff. How could that hurt? Well, it does hurt because people who would have quit don't quit. So it's believed that lowering tar levels probably worsen the situation. Probably reduced cessation so much that the net benefit was negative and worse in the situation. Tried to cut nicotine levels in cigarettes, make them less addictive. This sounds good. Okay, so someone's going to be smoking a cigarette, make them less addicted to it, they're less likely to continue. Well, anyone want to guess what happens? Yeah, by smoking more heavily, inhaling more deeply being good for you, or smoking more cigarettes. There's a loop there, a regulatory loop that wants to keep that nicotine level high. Um, and there's a whole set of other, other issues. Uh, Anti-lock brakes, very popular here in Canada, led people to drive more recklessly in many cases. You know, you know it's going to be able to stop you more reliably, so you go at that higher level of speed lot of different uh, cases where you know we tried to try to improve the situation and it actually ended up biting us and it's many of these cases it's because we had a very narrow vision we didn't understand how the pieces of the system work together how human behavior was involved there's lots of cases like this on applications that, that lie within sort of the computer domain um, cases of, of fantastic um, systems that uh, are great technically, but where they didn't think of the human as part of the system. They, they thought, okay, there's this technical system and it's great, and we're going to ship it. And humans were somehow viewed as outside of that. Humans are part of the system. And uh, if you don't consider that, you get perverse situations. Uh, an example I cited in 371 was uh, Denver Airport. So I knew some people involved, brilliant modelers in fact, though they're not systems modelers, but operations research folks, who devised a brilliant system for routing bags and um, uh, essentially making sure that, uh, that uh, cargo got delivered and bags got delivered to the appropriate airplanes at Denver Airport when Denver Airport was, was launched. The problem is, they had a system associated with it which, um, which required human entry of a lot of this information. And the system was really hard to understand. And so it did a great job routing bags if it was perfect information. But it wasn't perfect information. People were making mistakes. And so it was routing the bags to wrong places. And the, the system became highly dysfunctional. A system with more humans involved might have been more resistant because humans can use common sense. But this led to a system where you had yeah. bad information which could make things really gum up the works. They had a bunch of other issues uh, too with equipment um, that, was, uh, that was not uh, online at a time, um, at the right time. Um, software projects, similar issues, planning, large scale software systems, et cetera. Um, now, I had some example here, which I'm just going to flip through, which is some, th some health challenges. And, you know, here you could look at these as symptomatic, the sort of challenges that come up within any area. Situations where our policies seem to work and where they don't seem to work pretty well. This is cases of, of uh, chlamydia, which is a common sexually transmitted infection. Put a lot of effort into lowering this, and then the rates just went up. And there's a lot of question about why. Is this bad? Is this a sign of a problem, or is this a sign that we're doing things better? We're discovering cases that otherwise wouldn't be discovered. If you look at it systemically, it's not obvious that this is, is a very bad thing. You need to know what's driving it. Look at, on the base of it, more sick people every reported, more sick people reported every year. That could be interpreted as a very bad thing. What is causing it? Well, the numbers don't tell by themselves. Models help us understand that. There's structural complexity and there's dynamic complexity. Structural complexity might include the many, many levels that influence, for example, people's eating habits, which influence obesity and diabetes, heart disease, et cetera. People have mapped out 
the set of factors affecting obesity. And you can see some of them are physiological, some involve the food system, some involve transportation, et cetera. Try to map this out to make sense of it so that they can make sure that different parties are thinking about decisions in different areas of it. It's hugely complex at a structural level. But there's also dynamic complexity, patterns over time. So back in the 1700s, people noticed that there's this odd bell-shaped pattern associated with spread of infectious disease. You saw the sort of sudden rise and decay associated with the number of people dying from bubonic plague. This was seen for childhood infectious illnesses, where you get these kind of leaps up of the number of kids who have measles or mumps or chicken pox over time. This is from Saskatchewan. There's tipping points, cases where you know, you invest just a little bit more and the situation changes totally. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why that is. We're gonna draw out something called phase, pl phase plots or state spaces. And what you'll find is there's different regions of these state spaces. So there's different attractors, cases where the system will be in sort of get into an area where it's fairly stable. Maybe it goes and it oscillates around a point. And depending on what side of a sort of ridge you're on, you may go down to that one. Think of this as like going down the Pacific, or you may go down to this one. Think of this as going down to Hudson Bay. And maybe there's yet a third one up here where you're going down to the Atlantic or something like that. So these are basins of attraction in, in system behavior. And you may be able to nudge it over this boundary and get a situation where an infection, which was no problem before, suddenly becomes endemic. It sticks around. Think about antibiotic resistance that, that can keep a bug that used to be no problem around. Think about polio resurfacing uh, as a major health threat. These are, these are cases where you know a small difference at this point can make a huge difference in terms of the outcome. And it can be really difficult to get it from one basin over to the other sometimes. But if with enough effort, we may be able to do that. For example, vaccination may shift it from one point to the other. So tipping points, cases where just a small difference ends up totally changing things, and often in a locked-in way, a way that leads to sort of uh, being resistant to subsequent change. Very, 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 very important. Another issue is sort of, uh, if we understand things in terms of, of networks, say, one group or another group. Um, this may be uh, one community, another community, and there may be an individual going back and forth between the communities. Maybe it's an individual going back and forth between academia and companies, bringing ideas with them. Maybe it's someone going back and forth between two countries, say China and the United States. Maybe it's someone going back and forth between two firms, bringing some ideas. This person may be particularly key because they're a conduit for ideas. They're a conduit for infection. They're a conduit for percolation of, of information or of pathogen or processes, etc. It has to pass through them. And so they're particularly important. So if you want to improve a situation, you want to prevent a bug from spreading to one to the other, or you want to um, encourage some healthy behavior, you might focus on that individual as being particularly key. If you can persuade them, it can make it into a different community. And there are these plenty of communities. This is from uh, some TB data we work with for, for Saskatchewan. Broader TB network. Different communities here associated with different outbreaks and with different characteristics. And then you have some individuals who go back and forth. It's about um, 11,000 nodes out of a 48,000 node graph. Another phenomenon we'll see within this course is the impact of heterogeneity. So this is associated with uh, a number of phenomena, but informally we might say it's a situation where the, the tail wags the dog. Sometimes what really matters is not sort of the average person out there, the typical person, but that small, small, small segment of the population with unusual characteristics the ones on the tail of the distribution. Those, say, with large numbers of sexual partners over the course of a, of a one-year period. And if you, if you map these things out, often what you'll find is some unusual patterns that recur in many, many contexts. 
This is a log log graph. Does anyone recognize this, this? The fact that we have a straight line here, that's a sign that we have a type of behavior that's called what? Does anyone, has anyone seen this before? Scale-free behavior. Okay. And what that means is the same behavior is going to play out at many, many different levels of scale. It plays out with many levels of detail or, or high level of the, the system. In this case, what we're going to see is that your chance of having twice as many partners is the same, no matter how many partners you have. Sort of the proportional chance. So it might, might go down by a third. Um, you're having twice as many partners or what have you. And this can lead to uh, persistence of infection or persistence of ideology in small cores within a network in a way that otherwise wouldn't be effective. And people have noticed that there's really interesting effects over these networks. The spread of ideas, spread of innovations. So if you have a new, great new idea in computer science, its success in spreading will be uh, in large part dictated by sort of the, the network behavior that you'll see, the, the, the way in which it can percolate across a network of contacts. But you see uh, health behaviors, for example, um, associated with spread of obesity, even, even having network uh, effects. See a spread of patterns within landscapes, um, in this case associated with a, a sexually transmitted infection, um, and spreading in, in networks. This is for rabies. Uh, again, spread sort of spatially as, as animals uh, move out, in this case, uh, raccoons, and skunks, etc. And if you look historically, there's large cases of kind of spread of patterns uh, over geography as it spreads from one community to the next to the next, carried by traders, carried by um, those uh, travelers, etc. And it's been mapped in intricate detail for events like uh, the Black Death where it spreads across Asia over the period of decades, and then subsequently spreads within the Middle East, and then, uh, then Europe. Maybe originally in China in the 1320s, to India in the 1340s, Central Asia spreading across, and, and then within Europe. And you can see it coming in month by month and spreading um, successively in waves and sort of map, mapped out here. Um, so. This, these sort of patterns that we see reflect complexity with the underlying system. Um, complexity associated with uh, interactions, delays, feedback, situations where change in the system ripples around and cascades a, another set of changes that either push back against the original change or amplify it. Um, a case of, of pushing back might be something, a simple physiological situation like hunger. You uh, grow hungry, motivates you to go get something to eat. You eat a bit of nourishment, you feel less hungry. Very simple. Many other, many other physiological situations like that. Um, case of a of a vicious cycle might be associated with with an arms race, for example. So you build up a bit of armament. Your competitor builds up some armament. You build up even more. It may be associated also with uh, spread of an idea, spread of infection, where more people get it, more people pa are passed on, pass it on. So interactions, delays, feedbacks, nonlinearities. We'll go into this more within the course, but as I mentioned, it's fundamentally a characteristic of nonlinear systems that you can't consider the input just as a sum of pieces and know the behavior of the system for each of those pieces and then put that together to understand the behavior of the system with respect to the whole of the input. We can't do that in a nonlinear system. It defies that sort of piecemeal approach where we decompose the input into pieces, understand each of those, and then sum up. Finally, heterogeneity. This, this fact that the tail wags the dog off. So I've talked some for some motivations for complex systems approach. I'd like to talk where simulation fits into this. Simulation is, is fundamentally about is a component of system science. It's about putting the pieces together. It's about under the science of the whole, as it were. And system science can help us 
visualize and understand implications of, of, of connections, of, of systems that are complex that exhibit these sort of connections in this exhibit, and this sort of emergent behavior. Um, and a key way in which system science aids this is through the use of simulation models. Okay? Now, it turns out that these models are really important because they, they provide us a way to understand the impact of these connections in a way that traditional methods, traditional more reductionist methods don't. They don't replace those reductionist methods, they complement them. They incorporate understanding from them, but they, they, piece, they uh, incorporate that understanding in a way that you understand what the effects are of that interaction. These models basically are simplified representations of a hypothesized situation that obtains that we hypothesize to obtain in reality. What I mean by that, it's a lot of words there. What I mean by that is they describe how we think things may work. They're not perfect any more than our guess is how things work are, but they let us think through the logical implications of our assumptions and figure out if it makes sense, if it jibes with what we actually see within the patterns we observe. Okay? So these simulation models let us kind of posit dynamic hypotheses, these kind of hypotheses about how things may work, and, and see if those are consistent. If we just have those understandings, those guesses up in our heads, it's hard for us to evaluate them, because we're not clever enough to sort of figure out all their implications. But if we can have a model that helps us think them through. So simulation models are, are thinking tools, thinking tools that represent they capture sort of hypotheses for how things work. And they help us reason about the implications of our understanding. Okay. Um, so they represent hypothesized causal relationships between factors. You know, this triggers that, triggers that. And they provide a way to examine diverse consequences of changes in one area of the system to the whole system. So they're about representing the whole. By virtue of simulating it out step by step by step, we don't have to solve it analytically, although we may in some cases gain analytic insight. Um, we are not reduced to having to understand the response of the system to the input, to take the input apart into pieces, which we then know how it responds. Instead, we can simulate with respect to a wide variety of conditions. For example, instead of just saying, okay, we have this system simulation of a hospital and we're going to examine it with respect to this policy and this other policy and that other policy and then we have to somehow combine those results to figure out if we combine all policies together. Instead we can simulate all of those policies in, in operation at the same time. So models help us and system actors, those embedded in the systems that we're modeling, to understand vulnerabilities. Like why is this system so vulnerable to external disturbance? Often what we find is here that if you start looking at the science of the whole, if you start simulating these complex systems, the behaviors of those systems are typically more a function of their structure and the causal web and interrelationships that are incorporated in those systems rather than being simply puppets of external conditions. If they are influenced by external conditions, there's something about them that's leaving them vulnerable to it. And we look to the structure of the system to correct that. We'll see this as we start looking at feedback-based systems. There's something about this system that is driving this behavior we see. And even if the behavior is great vulnerability externally, that is an aspect of system structure and we could remedy it by changing system structure. For example, lower the risk an outbreak coming through the South Sudan airport will cause a spread of infection, we can lower that through vaccination or through effective quick reporting, etc. So understanding these systems using models helps us understand vulnerabilities, helps us understand leverage points, cases where just a small change in one area may have a disproportionate impact, where we can make get greatest bang for the buck. It can help us uh, design our system more effectively, put into place new mechanisms, say um, new um, information feedback, so we collect information that will let us make better decisions more quickly, and, um, and that can help us improve the behavior of the system. And we may identify key places we can do that. And finally, um, they can help us understand ways of working together. One of the things you'll see 
and, and I used to run uh, consulting businesses doing this sort of modeling. One of the things that we would see is that often when we talk to system stakeholders, the different stakeholders are at loggerheads. They're, they're, they're in opposition initially. Once you help them understand how the system behaves as a whole, often they'll realize that the, the way they're behaving, it may seem sensible, it may seem, uh, may seem only they're behaving in their interest, but it turns out that once you see the overall behavior, it's really against their own interest. I'll give you an example. So we worked with um, uh, universities in the states, um, university system of, of, of uh, Texas, for example, and what we found was that um, the, the universities there were fighting with the high schools for allocation of money by the government. So there's a fixed amount of money, was sort of their mental model, a fixed amount of money allocated by the government to education, and either they get it or we get it, and we want to get it, because we need it. And so they were fighting with it. Once we actually and talked with them about what their issues were, what their costs were, a lot of their costs were for dealing with deficiencies in the students coming to the university, having remedial training, having courses that need to be offered to bring students up to, to par, to, to function at a university level. U university system in Ham of, of Houston was the one I have in mind here. And, um, and one of the things they realized is if the, if the high schools actually functioned well, they wouldn't, they'd be able to avoid a lot of these costs. They'd be able to actually lower their costs greatly. And in fact, you know, the high schools could do their job a lot more cheaply than they could. So actually, they ended up lobbying together to increase funding to both of them. Instead of fighting over a fixed pie, they actually wanted more money to flow to the high schools and ended up recognizing that basically they're within the same embedded system. And if the system is failing as a whole, you know, they're both going to suffer. Um, so, you know, that's a case where actually just one example of many where you'll find that actually understanding the structure of the system can lead the different actors who have been working at loggerheads, working in opposition, to work together more effectively. It's a part of systems thinking. It's a part of why people are are drawn to these approaches. And simulation models are a component of systems thinking that are particularly powerful because they allow us to ask what if questions the different stakeholders can use. Okay, so simulation models can be viewed as dynamic hypotheses. We talked about that. They capture the causal structure, or hypothesize causal structure. Hypotheses about how the world works is how I refer to it informally. Um, and we need to encode this causal structure, what causes what, or at least what we hypothesize to cause what, because we need to understand counterfactuals. How patterns would change if we adjust the situation in a way that's never been observed. If we put in place this policy, if we were to fund high schools more than they've ever been funded, if we were to you know, add roads to our city in a way that's never been done before. We deal a lot in decision making with counterfactuals situations that we haven't been able to observe, we don't have statistical data on them because of that, and yet we have to reason about how would the system be different if we were to make that decision? How would things change? Simulation models are a tool for doing that. You can try to do that with statistics. You can try to do a regression and try to extrapolate what it might be. But you're not capturing the mechanisms. You're not capturing the underlying physics of the situation, so to speak. What drives what? And so you can sometimes get crazy things, like you say, okay, you know, if we could, if we could lower, you know, smoking by by such and such an amount, we'd have negative amounts of heart disease or something like that. It's non-physical. It doesn't make sense. We're not with statistics. The extrapolation. Um, doesn't take into account kind of how the system works. We may be reasoning about the amount of milk we get without reasoning about how many cows we can maintain, to, put, uh, to use an example that, that uh, someone introduced. So, you know, this is, this is uh, a, a type of extrapolation that's fraught with error. With simulation models, we're actually simulating the causal mechanism. We're simulating the physics of the situation, although at a certain level of abstraction, 
in a way that, that captures some of the regularities, captures the fact you can never have negative people or you know, um, negative, uh, negative uh, amount of uh, vials of uh, vaccinate, vaccine or what have you. So all simulation models are, are computational realizations of a mathematical process. We, we didn't see that much last time. But that simulation model, we could have actually described it mathematically. It would have been a fairly articulated uh, mathematical description. But it does have a clear, crisp meaning at a mathematical level. And we'll talk some in this class about um, how we characterize these models. What, uh, what sort of distributions are assumed for the stochastics? Um, when we do those stock and flow models, we'll analogize them will recognize that they correspond to differential equations, for example. And it turns out there's many types of m uh, mathematical frameworks for de defining simulations. And, and these frameworks basically focus on defining processes, uh, behavior over time. Okay. Um, so um, we've noted these as, as simulation models. They capture hypotheses for how the system works. And model parameters represent detailed assumptions. For example, for particular context, perhaps uh, it's a context associated with uh, you know, a, a very particular epidemiological situation or business situation, and it adapts the model to those specific contexts. So it's, it's, quite, um, it's a way of, of specifying particular assumptions about the, the situation being characterized, whereas the model as a whole specify sort of a general way in which the different components work together. How the system works, uh, these sort of systems work more generally. And often that can be um, translated to different contexts. Now, simulators have become extremely popular in a wide variety of practical areas because of their power. And uh, some of them are listed here. Um, folks in this uh, room would never want to fly on a plane in adverse weather unless you know that the pilot had been trained in thunderstorms. But an airline company is just not going to train, send a rookie pilot up to fly a 747 in a, a thunderstorm without lots and lots of training on a flight simulator. You're going to use a simulator that simulates the behavior of that plane under strong wind shear, under driving rain, or ice on the wings, or what have you. And you're gonna, the pilot's going to learn how the plane responds to that. It's not a perfect representation of the plane, but it's a representation of the plane that confers enough understanding of the things that matter for pilot training, namely how it responds to the throttles and so on, to behave uh, in a way that, that sharpens their skill. Um, other examples would be climate policy or training for power plants, driver training, etc. If you want to build a, a roads in a city, um, you're going to want to do analysis of, of traffic flow and street design. These are all cases where simulations have been have proven very, very useful to the point where they're routinely used uh, within these uh, within these areas. So let's talk about some of the uses of these models that we're going to be building up this semester. One of them is to make explicit mental models. Yeah. Are germane. Re are relevant. Yeah. So, is there ever a case where we have to include everything if there's uncertainty in whether or not the factor influences? Okay, so. The point of okay, so you've, uh, you've um, put your finger on an issue we're going to be talking more about next time when I talk about the simulation process. And uh, there's uh, an, an answer to one of your questions that's very clear. The other question is, is really an issue of where the art of simulation lies, okay? The answer that's clear is, could you put everything in? The answer is no. Because the world is, um, some, some of the sorts of models we look at are called modeling from the bottom up. The problem is the world has no bottom. You, know, uh, you can go down as far as you want and as much detail, and it's going to, at a, at a uh, conceptual level, you're never going to reach bottom. At a, at a practical level, you're going to be frittering away your time in ways that are, do not confer value. Okay? Um, however, uh, the art that I was referring to relates to your question on how do you choose what goes in when you're unsure. And there, you off 
often confine yourself um, to the practicalities of working in an incremental fashion and essentially adding in components so that, I mean, we, t we talk in software development about avoiding the Big Bang phenomenon, where we, we uh, you know, build up a software system um, often assigned to different people, and we put them all together you know, at the end and, and say, okay, we're going to tie it all together and it'll all work, and as often as not, it's a, it's a big hairball. It doesn't work together because people have made different assumptions, both reasonable perhaps, but incompatible. And, and it, it ends up uh, being a big problem. It's the same thing with simulation. If you, um, what we'll see now, it, it, we're, at a, we're at an unusual point um, historically in terms of the development of these methods because uh, for, for hundreds of years, um, people who aspire to uh, simulation, and it has been hundreds of years that people have, have done manual simulation. You know, computer used to be a term for a type of person, right? And, and they would do calculations. People sought to simulate out, say, the spread of infections in a population or the growth of plants or what have you. And in those cases, um, it required a huge amount of work. And so you needed methods which could be done with an economy of effort. And what we see now is that um, the simulation, uh, the ability of our simulation to characterize processes is actually very good. There's a couple things that, that limit us, but they tend to, um, they tend not to be things which greatly, uh, greatly limit how much we can put into a simulation up front. We, we could put a lot in. How much value it will confer is a different question, but we can actually add a lot in. These sort of agent-based models that we worked with last time, you could add in you know, as much detail as you want. And there's an opportunity there in the sense that you know, we can build very, very detailed simulations of a, you know, an airport or very detailed simulations of a computer system and, and queuing behavior, et cetera. Um, we can go as, as deep as we want, but there's a danger there because we may, again, you know, put our time into things where it's not best spent because our time is the key quantity. Human time often now um, is, is, you know, a, uh, a key issue. And so instead of being constrained as we've been for hundreds of years, sort of by the methodology and just the very need to sort of describe what we're doing, we're increasingly um, circumscribed by some limits computationally. Um, so there are performance issues. Um, there are some embarrassingly parallel problems where we can, you know, paralyze it out to a, a farm of, of, of machines. Monte Carlo simulation is an example of that that we'll be looking at in quite some detail. But there's, there's also thorny dependencies which prevent easy parallelization of a lot of things. So that's one constraint. And the other constraint is our time. We have limited time and, and our ability to reason about what's going on. If we put it all together in a simulation, we, we work and we just throw things in and we simulate it, often we get a, well, okay, so what? So it behaves in this way. What do I learn from it? We've reproduced a system that, you know, is thornily complex as well. It's much better if we can build it up incrementally, just we, as we build up software incrementally. Because when we do that, when we build it up incrementally, we develop our understanding, incrementally we develop our understanding of where phenomena are coming from, dynamic phenomena that we observe, emerge, this emergent phenomenon, where do they come in, and we can also more easily recognize when a bug is present. Because if we see some unexpected behavior, we can quickly look, there's only one or two things that have changed since the last time we ran it, so we can dive into that and you know, that, that's what allows us to, to quickly zero in on a problem. If we just throw everything together, throw in the kitchen sink, and we do a simulation, you know, after some period of time building up the system, it's hard to know what's a bug, what's real emergent behavior. You know, what, what is, are we surprised about for very solid learning reasons, and what are we surprised about because there's, there's something that kilter in what we've described. In other words, have we, you know, there's always the question, have we built the right, right model and have we built the model right? And, and often the surprising behavior is because we haven't built the model right, because there's a bug in there. But in other times, it's because there's emergent behavior. Because we can have both of these, we have to be very careful and incremental delivery of the system is often 
perhaps the foremost key for allowing insight to develop at the same time as suppressing uh, defects from biting us. Yeah. No. There was an unidentified identified notebook at the back of the room. Uh, sorry, okay. to, sorry, to I'm sorry, to I, I thought you were. Um, stop talking. There's something that looks like this, but this is the yeah, that's, like it. that's your. Um, it, why, it wouldn't be over in this file here. Nope. Nope. And is it, it leather or? It's leather. It's like that. I thought I left it. I, I thought I left it in my office. Let's, let's crowdsource this. <laughs> Everyone look in the two meters around your, your chair. Um, oh, man. Dwight, when I, was, uh, when I was setting this up and you were leaving, I didn't see it then. Okay, yeah, you bet. Sorry. Um, uh, okay, so, so the quick answer to your question, but this issue of what if you're uncertain? you know, about what to put in. You, you, you have to prioritize that building up with the model. You have to prioritize that incremental delivery so that you gain the greatest insight, you know, in each successive step. And so, you know, experiment putting in things you think are more likely to be at issue. And a lot of it is going to be matching, hopefully, understanding you have in the form of data, time series, or or other you know, observations of the system qualitatively um, that you're going to be trying to match up at the same time. And you're going to see, oh, it still isn't matching all of these. So it's not even face plausible yet. And you're going to keep on adding things in to try to explain patterns. So we're going to be talking about what's called pattern-oriented modeling. Um, this is a type of modeling uh, which has uh, particularly gotten attention in the context of agent-based modeling. Um, but basically, it's about reproducing um, patterns that you see and you wish to explain or that you wish to prevent or, or other things. And, and sort of using that as a logical knife to cut away complexity in your model. Okay? Um, and it's absolutely key to cut that complexity away. Because otherwise, we end up building a system that's just as complicated. Well, not just as complicated, but near, it has lots of elements of complication as the world, which it confers limited value. Um, Okay, so um, let's talk about some uses of, of models. One of the most valuable uses of a simulation model may not be obvious, and it's, it's to make explicit our understanding. Um, the analogy that's often given here is that um, we have mental models. We all go around with some understanding of how things work. We have some guesses. I shouldn't say understanding. I have some, we have some hypotheses for how things work. We think, you know, hear a, a rattle in our, our car engine, we, we have some understanding of what that might be, or some guess as to what that might be. The bus is late, we have some hypothesis, so, well, maybe it, maybe it actually went by, maybe I missed it because it was early, maybe, um, you know, maybe it's caught in traffic, um, maybe, you know, there was an accident or what have you, um, maybe, uh, maybe I was wrong with the schedule, the schedule was updated and I just didn't look. Um, these are all hypotheses. When we're dealing with uh, understanding complex systems, often the people operating those systems have very articulated theories about what's going on, how the system works. Someone who does orders for a company, for example, someone who builds computer systems, um, they have a, a theory for sort of what goes on, what's dominating, what's the major drivers behind the phenomena they see. The problem is that a lot of this understanding is trapped in their head. It's trapped in a way that they can't share it easily. They can't compare it uh, in a logical way with the data because they're not fast enough to think through all the implications. You can't take two people and easily compare their theories without spending a lot of time eliciting it. In other words, bringing it out. By building a simulation model, we can have a clear, unambiguous statement for what our assumptions are. And that allows us to focus our refinements on that. It gives us kind of a point of reference which we can refine. Maybe this is a, maybe it's not really a very good model. We know it's not a good model, but it's something that we can critique on a concrete basis to improve our understanding. And we can share it. We can refine it over time collectively. We can you know create different versions of it for different hypotheses. But the point is that it's no longer trapped in our in our skulls. 
and it can be simulated out in a consistent way. In other words, we can numerically simulate it in a way we can't what's in our heads. We may have a quite articulated theory about what that rattle is in our engine, but we're not going to be able to, to compare, you know, is the frequency of it similar to what I would expect if, it, if the piston was, you know, interacting with, with uh, the uh, fuel injection in a certain way. We're, we're just often not, not um, consistent enough in our reasoning to do that reliably. Another set of things, so sharing, advancing the cause of sort of um, understanding science in, in a way, um, decision making, a rigorous scientific decision making by sharing things. That's a big use. But also assisting in management of complex situations. They serve as what if tools. They allow us to ask about these kind of factors. What if this were different? What if that were different? And identifying desirable policies. These may be policies that are high leverage, that change things a lot, that are cost effective or robust. Um, robust under uncertainty about the situation going forward, things we can't control. They help us understand trends, make sense of interactions, of diverse information. I mean, all this information that relates to our corporate strategy, we want to make better decisions based on it. Um, prioritization of data collection. This is a key thing. These models don't replace data collection. In fact, they make us hungry for certain types of data that will that is particularly relevant. They can they can highlight for us certain things that make more of a difference. So that model last last time we looked at, there were some parameters we tweaked that made very little difference, like the duration people were infected, made very little difference. Um, meanwhile, uh, the chance of infecting the neighbor or how often you have contact with the neighbor, that can make a really big difference, it turns out. Um, in fact, how, how quickly it spreads, whether it spreads at all. So, you know, this issue of um, uh, some parameters matter more than others. We may in both cases be unsure, you know, we have a 20% error bar around that estimate, but one 20% error bar makes a much bigger difference for the behavior we care about, or for the decision trade-off between the decisions that we care about, that we're trying to understand. Um, they can help us understand commonalities, what things are in common between different contexts, and they can help in communication. These models, this is one of the things that's incredibly powerful about them. Folks, if you go on and you do some modeling, and I think a lot of you will go on and do professional modeling, you, you don't participate in modeling in the course of your jobs. Others may make a career of this. It's, it's actually a great career with far too few people who do it now. There's a dire need for people in this area. And one of the things you'll find that's kind of ironic is that building these models uh, requires rigor, and it requires uh, technical acumen, um, sophisticated thinking. But what you'll find is that um, when you use them, they have a disarmingly easy interface that can be associated with them. You know, um, totally non-technical people can end up using them and um, gaining insights from them. They don't understand what goes on inside. They maybe don't want to understand what goes on inside. They don't understand all the pieces. They don't understand the terminology. They may have never heard of, you know, emergent behavior. They may have never heard of nonlinearity. Never heard of a, you know, a, in Java, you know, a handling an exception or event-driven programming or state charts or or dynamic events uh, or you know uh, scale-free networks and all the things we're going to be talking about, but. These are incredibly powerful communication vehicles. They can let someone sort of run a micro world to try things out. And um, they are extremely effective in communicating to people in terms that they understand. Often much more so than sort of a, a classic mathematical model or a statistical model would be. So this is kind of co-evolution with we build, we have some mental model in mind about how things work that's often fairly qualitative, but maybe fairly articulated. We build up a formal modeling artifact, which is, um, which may contain uh, many pieces. Uh, it, uh, in this case, it shows state charts, could show stock flow diagrams, events, et cetera. And this is quantitative. It's, it has precise values associated with it. That doesn't mean those values are necessarily right. It's a hypothesis. And the goal of the model may not be to describe how things are in this particular situation, but more sort of to generally learn if things work this way, what would the consequences be? 
other models are designed to depict very specific situations. And we take that model and we run it, and we get behavior over time. We get behavior over space, for the sort of model we looked at last time, or over a network. And based on those observations, and based on observations from the external world, we refine our mental model. And we go back in this kind of loop. Um, and often, to do this most effectively, we choose what to measure in the external world, and we choose our actions. We choose to take this policy versus that one, and we compare the results with what we would have expected through the simulation model. So here, the model is a living document. It's, it's something which captures our current understanding of how things may be working. Um, and there may be many models that capture different aspects of it, or different hypotheses, and we refine them over time through successive observation and through successive action. But we get emergent behavior. We get behavior that's not programmed in any way into the model. Um, this behavior associated with uh, stochastics for some sort of outbreak, this uh, consulting engagement I did years back involving um, pricing for a uh, utility. Um, spatial behavior, this is spread of prion-based diseases in Saskatchewan. Each one of these is a deer um, moving over the landscape. Um, we saw this type of thing last time, you'll recognize that. Um, here we, we have a deer population, they're moving around and they're dropping prions, these infectious proteins in the ground which others pick up and get infected and they're spreading throughout this area. And we didn't program in that there'd be large amounts of prion near the lake shore. It's just the deer have to go drink every once in a while. So, you know, a large number of them go back and forth there and it ends up accumulating prions there. And this area between these two shores is particularly well traveled just because of the nature of the geometry. I wouldn't have anticipated that. When I first saw that, it was a huge aha to me, but kind of makes sense in retrospect. Um, in other cases, we'll be looking at more behavior strictly over time of different scenarios, um, different scenarios going forward. And we're going to see stochastics, cases where there's variability. The model's not always going to be deterministic. It's, it may exhibit variability just in the happenstance of who gets infected or how long someone stays infected, etc. Okay, um, I'm going to give you a glimpse of three modeling approaches that we're going to be talking about in this course. And each of them we're going to spend a fair bit of time on, uh, particularly the two top ones here. Um, so uh, the first is system dynamics modeling. Uh, this is a modeling that's distinguished in a couple of different ways. One of the ways is, it, uh, more so than any of the other two methods, um, it spans, uh, it really embraces sort of systems thinking and spans the qualitative and the quantitative side of things. Um, so it's a way that tries to confer value from the very get-go of a modeling process in terms of qualitatively eliciting our understanding of the system. Even if we haven't yet reached the point where we can describe it quantitatively, it provides us a way to, to diagram this out. And this is actually really powerful because it lets you engage with people who are not trained in simulation modeling in the way you folks will be, but who can sketch out their understanding in a quite rigorous way, but qual at a semi-quantitative or, or qualitative level. And, um, and then you could then turn those diagrams in and work towards a, uh, into a full model. It's a feedback-centric approach. It focuses on feedbacks as governing behavior. These can be s sort of uh, reinforcing feedbacks, which leads to divergent behavior, or balancing feedbacks, which lead to sort of homeostasis and uh, a s system in equilibrium that, that is resistant to change. Um, so it focuses on feedbacks and accumulation. Stocks and flows um, are, are quite, uh, quite important to system dynamics modeling. And it supports rich mathematical analysis. We'll see that it can be mapped directly to ordinary differential equations. And, um, and it's extremely fast. It is invariant of population size. So for simulating a population of people or cars or animals or what have you, we can simulate 100 times larger population at no cost, no cost. It's, uh, it, it doesn't depend on, on population size. It's just count of people in different states. If you multiply the count by 100, it's just a number. Um, so we're gonna talk about system dynamics modeling, extremely powerful way, very visual, graphical, and it has a beautiful declarative language associated with it. 
So you, you basically don't feel like you're programming with this. You're characterizing the system sort of at the level you're thinking about the system on. You're characterizing it at a high graphical level. Very, very powerful. Nature-based models we saw last time. Um, here we have a rich depiction of a population into agents. Uh, commonly, these are things like people, but you could have, there are agent-based models out there where the agents are cells. Students in one of my classes built one last semester, and there's, there's others around. There could be cases where the agents are organs within a body. I've even seen a model where the agents are teeth within a mouth. It's odd as that sounds. Um, and agent-based models captures the interaction between individuals within a population. It captures individual histories and trajectories over time. And you can represent network connections and nesting context. By nesting context, I mean hierarchies, sort of this person is within this class, which is within this department, which is within not so much logical, but physical hierarchies often. Um, you know, this person is within this school, within this neighborhood, et cetera. And you can reason about phenomena, emergent behavior at all those different levels. It captures heterogeneity extremely well. We can make agents extremely heterogeneous, very different. And it supports detailed policy planning. Um, planning policies which might depend on history, depend on network position, depend on position in space. Discrete event simulation is a very popular approach that simulates uh, sort of in a process-centric way. So it simulates the flow of, of individuals, typically so-called entities, through processes. Um, and these processes require resources to undertake. So these may be people flowing through a hospital, and the resources are things like x-ray machines um, and other diagnostic imagery, nurses, doctors, uh, gurneys, beds, wheelchairs, those sort of things, all resources to allow the patient to around, to be treated, to be uh, delivered um, diagnostic imagery, etc. And here it's process entry. Sort of people flow through. These individuals, kind of like an agent-based modeling, flow through, but they're operated upon by the processes. Sort of it's, it's, it's focused on the process. And it's exceptionally, um, exceptionally sort of uh, a nice way of describing sets of processes. People go in these sort of flow flows uh, in, in different ways through the system. So here we have, um, and this is going to be one of the last things I discussed today, um, two types of modeling that we're going to be spending a special amount of time on. The first is um, uh, type of modeling, system dynamics, where we divide the population into categories, susceptible, infected, recovered, say. And here's uh, agent-based modeling, where we divide people, we distinguish people as individuals, they are uh, color-coded and, and shape-coded here to indicate differences, heterogene heterogeneity among them, differences between them. And here we have networks, which may correspond, say, to sexual connections and to social connections. So a couple, two types of networks there. Um, and um, agent-based modeling is fundamentally a type of individual-based modeling. It captures individuals as software objects. People in this class will no doubt have Concrete ideas of object oriented programming before. And this is one of the reasons it's a prerequisite for this course and why it's so important to understand. Fundamentally, in agent based models, we are making front and center use of object oriented programming. And we're going to see notions like subclassing and subtyping playing an important role in understanding how any logic works. Objects provide a very convenient abstraction for individuals because they encapsulate the behavior of those individuals. Um, and uh, they're quite, quite a nice sort of fit for Java in the language, uh, and that's the language in which uh, any logic is written. So within an agent-based model, we have one or more populations composed of individual agents, and each agent is associated with some state. Well, it's associated with state and some properties, and some of these properties we might view as their state. By the state are here referring to sort of evolving characteristics. Um, so this might be, uh, if you're dealing with a person, aspects of age or health or smoking status or, or beliefs or their set of connections to others. And then there are parameters, things that don't really change, assumptions about that particular person, which typically change less frequently. Um, gender, genetic composition, um, uh, ethnicity, etc. 
rules for interaction, which are typically specified in, in Java code or, or um, in little snippets of the code that are woven into things like state charts or action charts. And now these individuals are embedded in an environment and they communicate via messaging or flows, um, in, in the sense of stocks and flows. And we have emergent behavior, which emerges over these populations of the agent. So agent-based modeling adopts the organizational style of object-oriented software engineering by clustering together elements of state and behavior per entity. So an, an agent wraps up its own behavior and its own, its own properties. And this facilitates convenient representation of nested relationships, it turns out. Like this nested set of, you know, I am within this class and a neighborhood and a city, et cetera. It's just successively nested objects with references to one another. Um, and, um, and then similarly, it, it facilitates uh, description of network relationships. So I want to contrast this with aggregate models because we're going to be seeing these and there's going to be this kind of going back and forth. So in an agent based modeling, and, and this is important. Our unit of organization is going to be the agent, okay? And on each agent, we're going to store data, which has to do with their properties. Some of them are going to evolve over time. We'll call them state. Some of them are going to be characteristics that are more or less, more or less constant. They're parameters. In contrast, stock and flow modeling, we organize it according to state and characteristics or properties. And then the data we keep track of is the count of people who have that characteristic. Let me repeat that again. This is going to be an important conceptual distinction. So within an agent-based model, we organize according to individual. And the, the data we keep track of associated with the individual is state or characteristics in general. They're state parameters. So they're characteristics. Within an aggregate model, we organize according to those characteristics, to those properties. We, we put in different boxes according to their characteristics. And the data there is the number of individuals with those characteristics. Okay? Um, so I'm going to just uh, draw this out here. But um, here we have, um, for example, um, uh, an aggregate model. So here are the different states. And we're counting the number of individuals within each of those states. As it turns out, this is going to map to a differential equation. And some of you may, may start to guess that these flows correspond to derivatives. Sum those up, flows in and out of the stock, you, you get the derivatives. But here is sort of the, each one of these is what we call a state variable in physics, commonly, um, or in, in differential equations. But this is a, what we call a stock. And that's, that's a number of systems count of susceptibles, the count of infectives over here. And you notice it's subdivided. We have these different counts associated with the different characteristics here according to health state. We might further divide them into sex, so we susceptible males, infected males, recovered males, susceptible females, infected females, recovered females accordingly. Subdivide according to characteristics. And the data we keep track of is individual is is the count, okay. Um, and if we have a multi-level um, component, um, we might total up something like the total population size. But it's all sort of at the same level of the model. We just have variables within the model. And this is an example of the sort of declarative framework we're going to be using within this context. Stock and flow models. These are auxiliary variables. And each of these is associated with a formula. Building up a model like this is an exercise in declarative programming. It's kind of like building up a spreadsheet. It's the opposite of a spreadsheet in a way. Because in a spreadsheet, ladies and gentlemen, this is a substantive issue. In a spreadsheet, we hide the formulas. We show the numbers. Here, the numbers are hidden. They're there. We can look at them if we want to. But what's shown is the relationship. What's shown, as it were, is the is the formulas or, or the um, abstraction of the formulas. OK, so here you know, we have things at two different levels. The total population size or, or uh, prevalence of infection, the total population. And then we have things sort of uh, uh, at a lower level. So um, 
you know, here we have sort of one horizontal level for the entire model. And um, relationships between units uh, are implicit in the data, so people, for example. In a nature-based model, what we have is, so if we have mixing between people in, in an aggregate model, it's sort of implicit in the data. In an agent-based model, we, again, we organize it according to individual, and so the constitutive units here are agents, and each agent maintains its own state. And so each agent might say, I'm susceptible, I'm infected, I'm recovered, other properties, and then they're in some, some context. Now the interesting thing here, and the important thing here, is that the nested or network relationships among, uh, among individuals mimic that in the world. So if we have, for example, a city, and the city composed, is composed of neighborhoods, and each of the neighborhoods has people in it, you know, we will have you know, individuals, and they'll have a reference to the neighborhood they're in, the, the neighborhood would have a reference to the city they're in, and there's sort of an isomorphism. There's a mapping here of nesting in terms of sort of this, this hierarchy that is absent in the system dynamics model, in this, in this uh, aggregate model we were looking at just before. So here we have sort of a nesting relationship or network relationship that, match, that sort of maps isomorphically onto these sort of relationships uh, in the world. Okay? Um, and we might have uh, aspects of individual state here, uh, which um, in these cases it's more sort of uh, um, you know, discrete characteristics, I should say, rather than state. And here's uh, some continuous characteristics. It turns out that continuous characteristics can be much better represented in an agent-based model. If you want to keep track of someone's age as a continuous factor, or you want to keep track of the level of virus particles in their body, or you want to keep track of their um, uh, cumulative amount ever smoked, or what have you, um, uh, the amount of, of uh, toxin ingested, you can do that much more readily in an agent-based model. To do it in a, in a system dynamics model, you'd have to divide them up into a large number of categories, and it still wouldn't be even a close approximation to continuous. Um, it would be a, a sort of crude, uh, discrete approximation. So um, when we have continuous variables we want to capture, some of them are given here, we, um, we, we find an agent-based model particularly desirable. Now it turns out in any logic, um, we can represent continuous state in continuous evolution by combining these methods. So we can have an individual, a person, say, who has, whose state evolves according to stocks and flows. Evolves according to these sort of, of flows you see here. And that describes the internal individual dynamic in a continuous way. These are sort of a continuous evolution. These are the state variables here, which might represent the level of virus particles level of immune response, number of infected cells, etc. Or we could have them evolving according to a discrete state in a state chart. Um, so uh, we're going to be seeing um, more cases where we have uh, individuals embedded. We're going to see uh, system dynamics models with stocks and flows, individuals and in, in agent-based models embedded as in networks. And we're going to talk about different types of networks. And we're going to talk about irregular spatial embedding. Um, within the discrete event context and how we can actually do similar things within an agent-based context as well. Um, okay, uh, so I think, um, I think we'll leave it like that. Suffice it to say that we get emergent behavior within both sorts of models. Um, within a, a system dynamics model, the emergent behavior is typically at the level of stocks and flows over time. Within an agent-based model, we also see emergent behavior between agents, say uh, agents in space, um, and agents over a network, um, a network that may be defined, uh, for example, in an irregular way like this. So we get emergence in both cases, it's just in, in different contexts. So we get emergence in, in discrete event models too. Um, and we can have multiple levels of context and see different behavior this is behavior at the high level, prevalent cases of infection. If you looked at how many people are infected last time, you would have seen a curve that looked like this. Um, and this is, this is in a case with, um, uh, we have no uh, loss of immunity, so the number of cases of infection goes up. Why does it go down here? Can anyone tell me? Yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. And, and people are recovering. So, in short, this goes up if the number of goes up from time one to time two. If the number of people have gotten infected in that time exceeds the number of people that have recovered in that time. And so it goes up for a while and then it starts going down. This is what we see at the individual, we, we see at the sort of meso level of the level of sort of the, the scale. And at an individual level, you're either in one state or you're in another. So there's matters of scale. We can construct scale, multi-scale models which capture these different, capture these different contexts. Okay, so in conclusion, um, you know, often we're intervening in a complex system. I use public health as one example, but um, it's one of, of, of many where we have to make thornily complex decisions. This complexity impacts intervention choice. And it, identifying the best intervention is really difficult. So many things going on. Systems modeling can help in this. Multiple modeling approaches can offer unique perspectives and are complementary. And really, this is a matter of uh, really deep interdisciplinarity. We're emerging into worlds where people um, are increasingly working in teams that go beyond one discipline and where you need to bring together experts from multiple areas, in your case computer science, but often from many different backgrounds, to effectively build a model that characterizes things in a way that will improve decision making. And we'll be seeing in that class that tension. There's a lot of things here that are, are con computer science in origin and nature but there'll be that ongoing mixture of other problem domains. Okay, so that's all for today. I've kept you a bit late. Thanks for your patience. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you talk about Oh, the uh, thank you, yes. I did mention that at the beginning, but uh, I will send out a doodle poll um, to see if we might be able to shift this uh, back by half an hour to allow everyone to attend without missing that other class, uh, including myself.